This announcement for us will now be recorded. Um, we're doing Bible study this week, this Sunday. So we need to remember to, I mean, this Wednesday, this Wednesday at six o'clock. We had game night last week and our goal was to beat Pete, but Pete brought Mary and Mary <laughs> literally beat us. It was the fastest game night ever. I mean, we, we only played 10 rounds and she had already won five times. So it was like seven o'clock and we said, well, it's already over. So, but Mary had a good time and we all had a great time. It was fun uh, doing that game night that we did. And, uh, we'll, we'll continue that on the first Wednesday of every month. And then, but this Wednesday we're going to be kicking back into our Bible study and look, do what? Yeah, you knew that we were going to beat you, so you you brought her. So, so, uh, but it it was fun. It was a good time, and but we'll have our meal at six o'clock, the potluck meal. So we invite you to come and and bring something to share, and then we'll start our Bible study by about six thirty. And if you can't join us in person, join us online, and we'll uh, be more than happy to interact with you online while we are here. That's the main announcement that I have. Uh, if there's not anything else that you'll have. Uh, just an update, we did have the Nomad people come through that's going to help us hopefully uh, put the new roof on and uh, fix some folks' house in the in the area that are damaged. Um, Maritza, I know, has some damage. There's some folks that have damage. Uh, we got a list of about 14 houses, uh, and they're not going to be able to come until this time next year. But I think we can hold everything off and then fix a lot of stuff up. So if you all know of people that, uh, had damage in that storm, make sure to let them connect with me and we'll put them on the list so that when that group comes in, uh, we can uh, utilize them to help fix stuff up. Um, so that's good. That's a big blessing. They met with Henry and I a couple weeks ago. And uh, so that's a big blessing. That, But it's also going to be a while too. It's also going to be, there's, there's been so many storms that, that our storms kind of, happened after other ones, so they'll be coming in, but they'll probably be coming in next fall. That is it as far as announcements that I have. So we will go ahead and open this service with a, a psalm. I'm going to read a psalm, and this one also ties into my sermon here in a little bit. So pay attention, and you might catch, you might catch part of it later as well. But we're going to read the 84th psalm today. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the, the swallow has a nest for herself where she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house ever singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you and whose heart and whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before the God in Zion. O Lord of hosts, O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your name anointed for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere i would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my god than dwell in the tents of the wicked for the lord god is a sun and a shield the lord bestows favor and honor no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly O lord of hosts blessed is the one who trusts in you father god we just come to you today and we we join in that psalm and we praise to you. It is a better one day in your presence is better than a thousand elsewhere. Lord, Lord you do bless us. You do uh, provide for us. Lord, open our hearts, open our minds so that we may receive from you that your presence is uh, with us in a day that changes today, that changes us more and more into your image. Lord, we, we love you and we praise you. We worship you and honor you. It's in Jesus Christ's wonderful and holy name that we can and do pray. Amen. Amen, amen. If y'all would stand this morning, we'll go ahead and do a morning. I don't know if it's a hymn. As the deer. Oh. 
Amen, amen. Y'all can go ahead and be seated. At this time, we're going to share our joys and our concerns. And um, first, we'll, we'll start with joys. I've been working in a, a chrysalis this weekend. I left last night about 1130 from the, the site and drove back to Lubbock. And but just uh, it's been just a real joy to, to be there. It's a college age chrysalis uh, for young ladies. So it's been a great time this past past three days. And just keep those young ladies in your prayers as they wrap up their chrysalis this weekend. And, and I actually met Estella's daughter-in-law. She was on the team. And uh, her son preached here when I was out of town, I guess when I was in Haiti last time. And and uh, I met the daughter-in-law, and she was on the team this time. So it was good getting to, to visit with her. So so be in prayer for all those folks that are on that on that chrysalis. Um, any birthday? I do have some concerns. As many of y'all know, Miss Florence passed away this past week, 
and she was 99 years old. And before COVID, she very she didn't miss very many times. That was her spot back there, and she was a big part of this church for many many years. And and um, we will keep you posted on when the the funeral will be. Do you have any idea yet, Mel? Yeah. Yeah, she just her daughter Luann just said she wasn't quite ready yet, so they're gonna they're gonna wait a while. But I'll keep all y'all posted, and when when that funeral is, we will definitely gather together for that. But she was a she was a dandy, and uh, we were definitely gonna miss her. And uh, also continue to pray for Mark Cervantes's family and the Garza family. As y'all know, he passed away two weeks ago, and and uh, so just remember their family and. Let's keep them in your, your hearts and prayers. Um, also, um, uh, Ernie and Betty, uh, who used to play in our worship team, their daughter was involved in a really bad car accident in Lubbock this about a week and a half ago. And uh, she's doing okay. I talked to her. I talked to, to Betty uh, two days ago, and she's doing okay. She's had multiple surgeries. I think she had like seven surgeries and they finally just had to quit doing surgeries because it was putting so much shock on her body. Um, but she broke both legs, her hip, sternum, uh, but she's just in stable condition now, which is really good. Uh, and they think uh, she's going she's gonna to be okay. So, so continue to pray for that family as well. Uh, but continue to pray for my dad. Uh, he gets a scan on Tuesday, and then we go down to meet with the, the oncologist and everybody on Thursday to, to hear about that and see the progress. So um, just be praying for, for my dad. Um, as always, there's some on the, the screen behind me, and if you remember those and pray for those, and if you have any that you want to add or subtract, get with Miss Jody today or Lonnie when he gets back. Also, Lonnie's not feeling good. Just keep Lonnie in your prayers. He wasn't able to make it today. Just, just pray for God's presence and healing in his life and just pray for God. Looks like you're about to say something. I, I am. I actually uh, was asking prayer for a couple of my cousins. I know I was talking to Mel about it. Uh, I, I just put Sulema de la Cerda in prayer. Uh, she's going through chemo and it hurts so much to see her and... Um, Marco Polo, where she's losing her hair and everything, and it's kind of like, uh, you know, but uh, prayers for her. You know, she says she's doing great. She's in good spirits, which is good, you know, so she's doing good. And uh, her sister, uh, she just lost her husband yesterday. Okay. He also passed away of COVID, so, you know, he was battling it. And then, you know, yesterday they gave us the news that he passed away. So, Selena? Per, uh, Salinas. Salinas? Yeah, Salinas. The family, okay. Salinas family, Dolores Salinas. And uh, um, just, you know, keep prayers for each and every one of them. I know I have a very good friend that's in the music industry also that is battling COVID right now in Harlingen. Um, he also has COVID and he's, I'm hoping the best for him. So also prayers for all the COVID patients that are still out there. So, Amen. Amen. So the Salinas family, yeah, Bob's friend down in Harlingen. Hey, we missed your birthday a couple of weeks ago, or did we get your birthday? Did you have a birthday? It's no. been a while. No. Uh, happy birthday, August 17th. <laughs> That's two weeks ago. Brother, you know what? I'm thinking that Bill Earl really wants to sing happy birthday to somebody. He really does. Yeah, we have any birthdays or anniversaries today? Oh, okay. Okay. Amen. Amen. If y'all remember, Mark passed away from COVID uh, this past year as well. So, and we, this church has been hit pretty hard with COVID. So, but celebrating a heavenly birthday—that's a good one. That's a good birthday. So, but he is missed. Any other prayer concerns or joys? Yes, sir, Tommy. Okay, Tommy's uncle. I don't see anybody mention anything online. Oh, yeah. Mm. 
So JC's uncle Gilbert just uh Oh, they did. Okay. Okay, Pena. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Do we have your niece also in? in no. Yeah, she had the brain tumor, right? Okay. So Brenda's pastor in uh, Snyder. Snyder passed away with COVID, and then Heather, or with her brain tumor, has three more weeks of treatment. So, yeah, Brenda, man, Brenda, if you remember, Brenda lost both of her parents to COVID, and uh, within a week, lost both of her parents. So, yeah, pray for the Alvarado family and that community as well. All right, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come to you today, and, and Lord, we just get so overwhelmed sometimes with just the stuff of life, the stuff that's going on around us. And sometimes we let those external circumstances just weight us so much, down so much that we can't focus on you and, and the hope that we have in you and the eternity that we have in you. And Lord, we just uh, are reminded today that that you are so good that you see things beyond uh, our current circumstances and you have uh, plans for us that go on for all eternity. Lord, we just uh, celebrate heavenly birthdays today. Lord, we celebrate um, just uh, birthdays and anniversaries on this earth. And Lord, we just thank you for your goodness. We lift up those girls that are at that Christmas this weekend and we ask that just you do a mighty work in there. Lord, that as they uh, leave that facility this afternoon, that they are just completely changed and that they see the world in a, in a very different way. Now, Lord, we lift up the Salimus family and just ask that you be with them as, as they have one family member that's very ill and another one that just passed away. We lift them up to you. But we, we lift up uh, Miss Francis's family and Lord, we just, we're going to miss her. She was just great. And, uh, She's always been so good to us and has just been such a big part of this family for many, many years. Lord, but we celebrate 99 years of just uh, of a great life, a life well lived. Lord, we thank you for her and we thank you for the way that we were blessed by her. Lord, we continue to lift up uh, Mark's family and just ask that you continue to minister to them and just that your peace and your guidance, uh, your presence just be with them at this time. Lord, we lift up uh, Tommy's uncle as he is not doing well. And Lord, we just ask that you be with him at this time. We ask that your, your presence, your healing touch, your peace be with him. We pray for wisdom. We lift up JC's uncle, Gilbert, as he's not doing well at all and he's been in ICU for quite some time. And Lord, we just pray for him. And, and Lord, uh, we just pray for that family. It looks like his time on this earth is drawing closely to the end. Lord, we just pray that you minister to them, that you give them peace, that they can see the big picture as well. Uh, Lord, we just pray for Brenda's uh, Blues family, pastor of the church family there, and, and Snyder as he passed away and they had the funeral yesterday. That community has been hit hard, as most of them have, by this pandemic. And, Lord, we just lift them up. Lift that church up to you and lift that family up to you. Lord, we lift Heather up to you as she is continuing her treatment for her brain tumor. And we just ask that you just heal it. You take the tumor away, that you shrink it, and then it just dissipates down to nothing. Lord, we pray for my dad and his scan that's coming up this week. We pray that it's a good report. And I just pray that uh, it will be something that will encourage him this time. Lord, we pray for your peace and guidance and all of that. Lord, we, we pray for this world. Uh, we pray for everything that's going on in Afghanistan and the crazy amounts of rain and storms that have been going on, Lord. But there are people dealing with stuff all over the place, Lord. And you are present in the midst of all of it, Lord. We just pray that your peace be there. That your kingdom come in those places, Lord. 
Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for Wayne that he's back with us today and had a had a hard night a couple weeks ago last week. And we just thank you that he's here. He is healthy today. Lord, we love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus Christ's name that we can and do pray. Amen. And as I invite the ushers to come forward for our morning offering, I, I forgot to pray for Lonnie. We pray for Lonnie as well. We mentioned that. Pray for Lonnie and his healing. And just pray for his well being as well. We'll ask the ushers to come forward. And as they do that, we will continue to worship, worship God with our tithes and offerings. Amen. 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 Pastor said, let's go ahead and continue to praise and worship this morning. Amen. You know, we can go ahead and stand. And uh, again, like with this COVID, uh, I can tell you, go around telling somebody how much Jesus loves them and how good it is to see him this morning. Did I say something wrong? <laughs> my wife, I said that and my wife looks at me. She just grunts like this, like, did I say something wrong that I wasn't aware of? But <laughs> Oh, she can't see. I'm sorry. She broke her glasses, so she can't see. She's trying to focus on me, I guess. But anyway, as I was saying, you know, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. And uh, if y'all would, I can go ahead and walk around and uh, wish the person next to you a good day and tell them how much Jesus loves them and uh, and uh, just say hi to each other. Amen. This power, this power, you decide, you decide. We are together, together, waiting for one. This power, this power, you decide, you decide. We are together, together. Oh, hear them sound from heaven. Oh, mighty rushing wind. Oh, the calling for revival. God is a fire for the wind. It's burning in my soul. Burning in my soul. Your sins and your doubts, the meaning of things are the promise. See the signs and the wonders, kingdom of God. Oh, hear the sound from heaven. Oh, mighty rushing wind. We're calling for the Bible, dying to die for the end. It's burning in my soul. Burning in my soul. Cannot contain it, you fire and sign. Cannot contain it, so let it shine. Cannot contain it, be of mine. Burning in my soul. Oh, oh, oh. Burning in my soul. Oh, oh, oh. 
Oh, 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 hear the sound from heaven. Oh, 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 mighty rushing in. Oh, 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 we're going for a battle. Our little fire fall again. It's burning in my soul. Burning in my soul. Contain it in fire and sign. I cannot contain it so it shine. I cannot contain it, this light of mine. Burning in my soul. Oh. Burning in my soul. We are together, together, waiting here as one, waiting here as one, waiting here as one. Amen. Come on, be seated this morning. Amen, amen. Thank you, Harv, for doing that. I just want to remind y'all folks that are, that are joining us online today, we're going to be doing participating in Holy Communion. And I just ask that if you want to do that, just go ahead and find some bread and some juice. Whatever you got, we'll uh, ask God's blessing upon it later. But we will be doing that later, and we want y'all to be able to participate with us in that as well. This weekend, I was in Amherst. As I told you, I was doing that uh, Christmas in Amherst this weekend, and and um, most of y'all have been on a, a walk to Emmaus, but there's a thing on Saturday night where you, you go and you experience some pretty cool stuff, and, and, and the facility there isn't big enough to do it, so we have to walk to another church. And, um, and the church that we went to is Amherst First United Methodist Church. And uh, as last night when I was leaving, is about, gosh, it's about 10.30 or so when I was walking out of that church, heading back over to the facility, I, I remember something. That was the very first sermon I ever preached uh, was in that church uh, before I went to seminary. Uh, they, the district superintendent, Les's cohort uh, from the Amarillo district, called and asked me if I might be willing to go preach in a church before. He had heard that I was going to be going to seminary and becoming a preacher and said, hey, you want to go preach in this church? And I said, sure. And I was reminded sitting in there last night of how horrible that sermon was. I mean, it really was. I've never done it before. Nobody had ever told me anything about how to. The only time I'd ever shared in church before, there was a pastor that kind of introduced me and I stood up and then he. I just kind of shared my testimony and stuff before that time. And. And I was there, and I was supposed to be the pastor. And I literally just came in, I sat down on the front, and I just sat there. And so somebody stood up, and they came up, and they did all this. And, and then it was my turn. I came up and preached, and I didn't even I didn't even pray at the end of my sermon. I literally said, it was a horrible sermon. And at the end of it, I said something like, well, that's it. That's all I got. And I, and I went, and I sat down, and it was real awkward, but I didn't know what to do. So this guy in the back of the church, like where Tommy's sitting, he gets up, he walks up to the front, and he, he kind of ties a bow on the service and prays and gives a benediction and sends everybody out and all this stuff. And, and that church, I was thinking about it last night, that church, I was at seminary for four years, and every three months while I was in seminary, that church sent me a check uh, to help me pay for seminary. And I, I always tell them when I go back, I said, I don't know if that was because y'all thought I needed a whole lot of help or if, or if y'all saw something in me that that there might be something worth uh, worth pouring into, but I, I'm very thankful. So if this sermon today is any good, it might have something to do with that faithful church that heard a really, really it was really bad, Les. I hope the one today is a little bit better, but it was a really bad sermon, and and boy, they just they knew their part as the body of Christ. Uh, a good song you picked out because we're talking about the soul, right? We're talking about the soul and. And we've been talking about the soul the last two weeks, and we're going to be talking about it again today. Um, but the soul, the soul is the deepest thing. It's the, in Scripture, it's the deepest part of us. It's the true identity of who I, who we are. And some 
parts in scripture that, that would, they would say that it's our heart, but it's the very deepest part of who we are. And it's the part that connects with God. It's the part that in Genesis 2, it says that and God breathed life and they became a living person. And the correct way to translate it, they became a living soul. They became a living soul. And uh, last week we talked a little bit uh, about Jesus' words and his parable of the sower of the seeds and the different types of soils that are out there, the different types of souls. And we're reminded of Jesus' teaching that he, he says, what is worth more than the soul? Some translations it said, you know, can you trade anything for a soul? You know, the, the soul is the most important thing. And that's why we're talking these, these weeks is just that this is our soul focus. It should be our, our soul should be our soul focus. As I mentioned last week, Dallas Willard had a great, um, a great quote, and his quote was, it's not what you accomplish in this earth that's important. It's what you become. It's the person that you become. And, uh, and I believe that more and more to be true every day, that it truly is about what we become, the person that we become, and being formed more and more into the image of God. And in doing that, we do that through our souls. Uh, through the soul work in which God is doing this. So, you know, the first verse that I want to look at today is the one that I read also for um, our call to worship this morning, but I'm only going to read part of it, one verse, and this is uh, Psalm 84, 2, and it says this, I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord. With my whole being, body, and soul, I will shout joyfully to the Lord, the living God. You know, his in this it talks about in some translations it says my soul faints with all that I am. My soul faints, and, and there's something about the soul, the deepest part of us. In the, our soul faints, our soul wants, our soul longs. You know, I remember as a little kid going to church camp and and uh, hearing the guy say something to these lines. You know, there's a hole inside of you that can only be filled by God. You know, have y'all ever heard that language before? There's something missing inside of you that can only be filled by God. And, and that's something that's missing. That's our soul that is crying out to the creator that created it, that, that breathed life into it, that, that our soul is crying out to be completed by that. And, and that is something that you see in everybody. Everyone, everyone has this desire for more, this, this longing for more. And um, that's the one thing that, that is not limited, I think, in our, in our existence is our desire for more. And that desire for more comes from the fact that we have this soul that longs to be in relationship with God and to be filled with God. Your soul is vulnerable because it is needy. If you meet those needs with the wrong things, you know, the game is over. You know, our, our soul is vulnerable because we were created for it to be filled with something. So we are needy. And so often we look to other things to fill that, you know, fill in the blank on what people in the world feel those, feel that neediness, whether it be relationships or money or possessions or whatever it is. So many of people are trying to feel that longing with things that are external when the only thing that we can really feel it is the thing that is eternal in God in a relationship with he, in a relationship with him. You know, Thomas Aquinas, who's an old school uh, theologian from back in the day, he wrote that, that this neediness of the soul is a pointer to God. He, he would have discussions with folks and say that that neediness that you're in your life, that, that longing that you have, this is something that God has put inside of you that you want more, that there's something more out of there, and it's something that's pointing to God. Aquinas would argue with folks that saying that that desire inside of you, the only thing that can fill that desire is God. We are limited in virtually every way. Our intelligence is li limited. Our strength is limited. Our energy is limited. Our mortality is limited. There's only one area where human beings are unlimited. We are limited in every way but one. We have unlimited desire. And if you think about that, that's really true. We have unlimited desire. And that's the way that God desires. He wants us to know more and more of him 
that our roots grow down deeper and deeper in him, that we experience the love of God, and he transforms us more and more and more into the image of Christ. You know, last week we talked about the parable of the, the sower of the seeds and the shallow soil, the shallow soul. Our souls are deep. You know, we think sometimes that it's our soil is shallow, but God creates us with a depth, and there's a longing, there's a desire there for more. You know, the, the Hebrew word for soul is nephesh, N-E-P-H-E-S-H. That's the, the English transliteration from the Hebrew word. And it it's, um, there's a book that, that I read that when they wrote a chapter about nephesh, uh, they, they wrote about ruah, which is the word for spirit. And they wrote, they wrote about all these different words. And, and, the, and when they got to nephesh, the soul, and they just broke down all the ways that word had been used in Hebrew in the Bible. And the title of that chapter was called The Needy Man. The Needy Man. And uh, I'm not going to tell you everything that, that I read in that, but the whole point in, in this chapter was that when we talk about the soul in Scripture, the soul is some, it's the needy man. It needs God. And it's the only part of us that is, that is completely designed to be what communicates with God. You know, it's our soul that communicates with God and translates it to our heart and to our minds and to our body. That, that soul is the eternal part of us, and it needs that relationship. And I think we can all uh, think of people that have filled those needs with others, but I, I think about that one millionaire that made the big plane. Uh, what was his name? Hubert, uh, I can't remember his name, but he had the big plane. He wanted to buy the biggest, build the biggest plane and all that. And on his deathbed, they, they asked him, and at this time he had millions and millions and millions of dollars. And this was when a million dollars was like a billion dollars, you know. And what do you, how much money do you want? And he said, just one more. I just want one more dollar, just one more. And uh, But he, on his deathbed, he was still longing for more when at the time he was without a doubt the richest person in America. The truth is the soul's infinite capacity to desire is the mirror image of God's infinite capacity to give. I'm going to read that again. The truth is the soul's infinite capacity to desire is the mirror image of God's infinite capacity to give. What if the real reason we feel like we never have enough is that God is not yet finished giving? The unlimited neediness of the soul matches the unlimited grace of God. You know, if y'all hear me talk about grace, grace is the unmerited favor of God, which we don't deserve. And my favorite definition of grace is God's active love, A-C-T-I-V-E, his active, God's love in action. And, and, and what this statement is saying is that, that our neediness, the only thing that can feel that is God's love in action in our life. And, and that is what fills us. So, so the soul longs, the, the soul needs, and we are tempted to feel that needliness with other things, as I touched on. You know, that brings me, I was thinking about it in Scripture, um, you know, who's somebody, I, I always like looking at a character in Scripture and seeing truths in that, and uh, I was thinking about this one little guy in Scripture, we're going to read about him just right now, but he's found in, in Luke. Uh, and this is Jesus, and y'all recognize this story really quick, but this is Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and he called him by name and said, Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He had gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. 
Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save, the, save those who are lost. You know, I, think, I, I love that story. And y'all heard me speak on that, that text at least once in the past you know, year. But I'm going to look at it a little bit differently today. Zacchaeus had a soul that needed. His soul longed. And, and, and it longed, and, and Zacchaeus, it's very clear that he lived his life for much of his life longing for to fill that with something. He became the chief tax collector in the area of Jericho, which meant that the other tax collectors were under him. He was over the tax collectors in that whole area. So he was really... he. He had access to great power. He was access to great wealth. But in that great power and that great wealth, there was uh, another side of the coin because the people didn't like him because he was, he was a, a Jewish person that was now working for the enemy, raising money for the enemy. And, and, and as he raised money for, for Rome, he was skimming off the top of it, it pretty, probably pretty much as he wanted. And he became very rich, so the people didn't like him. So there had to be a struggle in Zacchaeus. He was like, I, I, there's something wrong here. I need to feel it. So I'm going to fill it with power. I'm going to fill it with money. And then as he did that, it wasn't enough because the people didn't like him. People despised him. You know, in the story, we, he smiled. Nobody opened up and said, hey, Zacchaeus, get in front of me. You know, hey, hey, buddy, come on. You know, they were like, uh -uh, Zacchaeus, we know who you are. You can't see Jesus when he comes into town. And they blocked him off. But, so he had a lot going on in him. And one of the things that we can read behind the, the lines and between the lines and behind the scenes is that he was needy and he was trying to fill that with power. He was trying to fill it with money. And he probably wanted to have friends and stuff, but he, but he couldn't. There was a need there that he knew needed to be filled. And um, he came to the right place. You know, this is where grace comes in. Um, Zacchaeus probably had many idols in his life or many things that he was trying to, anything that you put before God to try to take the, the place to fill you and to, 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 to fill that void, you know, that's an easy thing to call that as an idol. It's anything that we put before God, uh, to, to rely on before God. So that money, that power, um, whatever that is. And that's where Zacchaeus was. And this is where grace comes in. I cannot replace an eyeball turning away from it. I must turn towards something. You know, Jesus, I think Zacchaeus probably, he, he, he oh, this money's going to make me feel this power's going to be, but, but, oh, I want friends, you know, whatever it may be, but you, you can't replace an idol by just turning away from it. You know, that's the whole thing about repentance that y'all hear me talk about. You know, one of my biggest pet peeves in the church is that repentance has more to do with the sin than it does to who we're turning towards. The true meaning of repentance isn't turning from your sins, it's turning towards God. You know, when we turn towards God and our focus is on Him, that's the importance of repentance. But so many people are, are, are obsessed with don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, do this, do this, do this. And the reality is, is it's, you need to be facing God and going, and your focus is on God. God is the one that can fill that void. So we must turn towards something. It is in the nature of the soul itself uh, to, to fill that need. What the soul truly desires is God. We may try to fill that need with other things, but the soul will never be satisfied without God. Our soul begins to grow in God when we acknowledge our basic neediness. Our soul begins to grow in God when we acknowledge our basic neediness. You know, Zacchaeus did that on this trip. I mean, he was he climbed up into a tree. He made a fool of himself where people could look up his skirt or whatever it is. He climbed up and made a fool of himself, but he needed Jesus. And, and when we acknowledge our neediness of God, that's when that void can be begin to be filled. I saw several girls this weekend on this Christmas that for the first time 
they acknowledged their neediness of God. They acknowledged the fact that they needed a God. We often operate on the unspoken assumption that our inner world would be filled with life, peace, and joy once my external world was perfect. That's a great recipe for a healthy soul as long as you live in a perfect world. I'm going to say that again. We often operate on the unspoken assumption that our inner world would be filled with life, peace, and joy once my eternal, external world was perfect. And that's a great recipe for a healthy life, a healthy soul, if we lived in a perfect world, but we don't. So, so most people are trying to manipulate their outside life to change their inside life. And, and that is, that's, where, that's where the mistake is. We change our inside life so that we may deal with the broken outside life. We don't live in a perfect world where we're going to be able to line all the dominoes up perfect to when we push it. It goes, and it knocks down every domino. That doesn't happen. But most people try to organize the outside to impact the inside. But what scripture is telling us that it's the inside. That's the important. It's not what you accomplish, as Dallas Willard said. It's the man or the woman that you become. You know, Zacchaeus knew this. Zacchaeus was the one that was responsible for his soul. He knew that he was responsible. He made mistakes in the past, but he knew that he was the one that was responsible for it. And we are responsible for our soul. Just as I talked about two weeks ago when I was talking about the stream that was coming down from the, the mountains and came into the little village, and as long as the stream was good, um, there was life and uh, health and, and all this. But when they quit tending the stream, uh, disease and bad water and runoff from the pig farm and all that came in, and people started getting dying and sick and leaving. You know, so just as that river is responsible for the for the health of the village, so our soul is responsible for our health in this world. And um, we are the only ones that contend our river, our soul. We are the only ones. Javier, no much how much I love and trust Javier, he, can, he cannot take care of my soul. He can do the best that he can to speak truth into my life and to love me and all that. But I am the only one that can take the responsibility of turning from whatever I'm looking at to try to fill that to turning to God and trusting in God. I am the one that I'm the only one that's responsible. That's it, you know? Because my grandmother went to church, that doesn't mean that I'm going to have a healthy soul. You know? I mean, my mom prayed for me. Yeah, it helps, but I'm the one that has to take the responsibility. I have the free will. I have the choice on what I'm going to try to fill myself up with. And Zacchaeus, he got to the point to where he knew that. I think Zacchaeus in that, that text that we read earlier, I think Zacchaeus' soul fainted and yearned and it cried out for the Lord. It doesn't say that in the text, but I think as he stood up in that tree, he was crying out for the Lord. He was crying out for the Lord. You know, our soul longs, our soul needs to be filled, but we are the ones that are responsible for our souls. We need to be the tenders of our Bulls. You know, Dallas Willard, y'all hear me talk about this guy all the time, but I love Dallas Willard. Um, he says, he had a conversation with a guy named John Eldridge at one point. And John Eldridge goes to him and he says, he says, hey, my church is a mess. My, my church is a mess. They're not doing good. I need some help on um, turning my church around so that my church becomes more active and fruitful and begins doing what they, and he asked Dallas Willard that question. And Dallas Willard responds with this answer. He says, you must arrange your days so that you'll experience the deep contentment, joy, and confidence in your everyday life with God. So, so Andridge was asking about his church, and Willard responded with Eldridge. He, 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 you know, and John Eldridge says that he was frustrated because I wanted him to say, do this Bible study, do this, do this, this thing, you know, encourage him to go on a mission trip, you know, whatever it was. But Willard's response was, 
you must arrange your days so that you experience deep contentment, joy, and confidence in your everyday life with God. Eldridge was trying to manipulate his external circumstances to change his internal self. And, 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 and Dallas was saying, man, it doesn't matter how good your church is, there's something that's wrong inside of you that you need to deal with and you need to rely on God. You need to organize your days, arrange your days so that you experience deep contentment. Deep contentment meant that no matter what is going on, in the here and now around me, I am content. I am content. No matter if, you know, I get called into the funeral home during church and I have to leave and go to the funeral. I'm just messing with you. Now. But I know that's what she's doing. <laughs> but if you have to go do a funeral right now, uh, no matter what, the contentment is fine. No matter what you're, he said, there's a deep commitment, a joy. I love that word joy. Joy isn't, I, I was Unbelievably happy when I turned on my phone last night and saw that the Texas Tech Red Raiders won. Because the last time I checked, they weren't doing too good. And then they scored 31 answer points, and I was happy. But I didn't experience joy. Joy shares the same root as grace, care and caress. One word is caress, joy, care is joy. And, and you only experience joy through the grace of God, the active love of God. So what Dallas is sitting there saying, he says, don't, don't worry about what's going on around you. You need to be content in who God is, and you need to experience the love of God, the grace of God, the joy of God in your life, and the confidence in your everyday life with God. So, so what he was saying is that your church will be more deeply impacted by you if you are in a good place. If you can, no matter what happens, if you are in a good place and you are content and you're experiencing the joy and the grace of God and you are living into the promises, the confidence that you have in your everyday life with God, that is what matters. So often we get so wrapped up in I want to change my circumstances to make me good, to make me healthy. But it's more about our internal stuff that's going on. You know, Galatians 6, 7 through 9 says this. It says, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of the world. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. You know, that, that first part is where we get you will reap what you sow. He uses the word harvest. But I think he used plant and harvest. But you will reap what you sow. Um, and if we're looking to find life, I think this is when people talk about, you know, things that go around, come around, all this stuff. But in Scripture, it's very clear. You're going to reap what you sow. And if you're, you're trusting on evil things and sinful things to fill that void inside of you instead of the Spirit of God, the presence of God inside of you, to feel that, you are going to reap what you sow. If you trust on things that are broken of this world to feel that, you're going to get things that are broken. Eh, broken. But if you trust on things, you trust on the Spirit and you trust on God in your life, you will reap what you sow. It's not what we accomplish on this earth that is important. It's the person that we become is what is important. So my final statement on that is take Care of your soul. Take care. Of, you are the keeper of your soul. You are the one. And as Jesus, we said last week and the week before, Jesus said, "There's nothing worth more than your soul." You know, talk to your soul. Okay, talk. Let me break this down to you. The soul is a part of it's the deepest part of us, and sometimes we need to understand self. Um, Soul, why am I so angry? Why am I so bitter? Why am I so jealous? Why in the world, when Mary won last week, five out of ten games, did I get mad? I didn't get mad, Pete. I'm just kidding. But, but, but we need to talk to our soul. We need to acknowledge what's going on. 
I, I truly believe that that is one of the deepest levels to acknowledge what's going on, to be honest with ourselves. And when you're talking to that area, you're not only talking to yourself, you're talking to God. You're talking to, to God. In the Bible, people talk to their souls. The difference between talking to yourself and talking to your soul is that the soul exists in the presence of God. That's where God resides inside of you, is in your soul, that eternal part of you. The difference between talking to yourself and talking to your soul is the soul exists in the presence of God. So you will see in the Psalms and, every, and elsewhere people speaking to their souls because when you speak to the soul, it naturally turns to prayer because in the soul, God is always present. You know, I have friends that struggle with anxiety. And um, I had this one friend, and she had struggled with anxiety for as long as I knew this person, since she was a college student. And um, she had a light bulb come on about two years ago. When she started calling the anxiety in herself, she started calling it some weird name, like Sally or Susie or something like that. But when she started feeling anxiety and welling up, she'd go, Sally, what are you doing? You know, there's no reason for you. To, and, and, and just naming it and calling it out there, she said, was healing. Because she knew that that wasn't supposed to be something that was a part of her. She knew that there was something more. And, and as she did that, she experienced this prayerful change to where she received peace in that. Was she still worried? And said, yeah, but the, the overcoming anxiety attack, she was able, because in a way, she was praying about it. She was acknowledging what was going on inside of her. And what was going on inside of her was probably not God's design. And she was acknowledging that, and in a way, she was praying about it. Um, Friday night on this retreat, um, there, there's, this, there's this opportunity where we give the, the, the people that are on the retreat to, to nail something to the cross, right? Something that's been bothering you, something that's been hurting you, you know, whatever, the sin, Whatever it is, and we give the, the girls or the guys, whatever it is, an opportunity to go up and they, they physically nail it to the cross. You know, and this Friday was, was a unique night because somebody that wasn't on the retreat actually showed up. And I told you about my friend who passed away and we did his funeral three weeks ago yesterday. And um, the guy that would pull over and change tires for people, uh, Joe Gillespie is his name. And, and he would, he just this great guy. And, he, and I told you how good the funeral was. Well, last night I'm sitting, or that Friday night, I'm sitting in the very back of that chapel. And in walks his wife. And um, she's on the chrysalis board. And I think she was supposed to be on this team. But since everything was happening with husband and everything, she dropped off the team. So it wasn't really abnormal for her to be here because she's, I think she's the lay person, lay leader of the whole Christmas board. But, but she walked in and she came to that back and, and she sat right next to me. And we kind of were whispering and stuff. And, and um, she leaned over to me and she said these words. She says, I think I'm angry. I said, I think I'm angry. And she said something like, I can understand that. Your husband buried Joe three weeks ago today. And she said something like, this past week was great. And uh, so I reached under my chair and got the little thing that you write the, the deal on. And the guy next to me, his name was Bruce. He reached down and got the pencil. And I gave her the little piece of paper. And Bruce gave her the, the, the piece of paper. And she's sitting there and she writes something down. And everybody had gone. Everybody had gone. And we're, it's just this awkward silence. You know how it is sometimes in church services where you're just sitting there. And I just felt inside of me, I was like, I need to ask her if she wants to go up there. So, so I look at her and I said, you want to go up there? To go up to the cross, to nail it on the cross. Yeah. So we get up there. We're the last ones. We go up there and I nail something on it. And, and she nails it on it. And, and in her nailing that, and it was her anger. As she nailed her anger onto that cross, she literally broke and she just wept 
and wept. And she said it was the first time that she really had the opportunity to cry. You know, because she was so busy trying to look good on the outside that she'd really never been able to experience the raw emotion of having to, to bury her, her husband. And she, she wept and she wept and she cried. You know, they, they did an experiment a call, in a college. They did an experiment where they showed pictures of people with different expressions on their face. So I want to use the Condies. So they invited the Condies in, and they looked back at pictures of the Condies, and there was a picture of Henry where he was real angry, and a picture of Kendrick where he was sad, and a picture of Rosemary where she was uh, jealous or, or, or whatever it was. And, and they, they showed them these pictures, and they, they analyzed, I don't know how they did it, but they analyzed it, and they asked half of the people in that room to name the emotion that you were feeling in that picture. And then they told the other half to just look at the picture. And somehow they measured it, but the half that named the emotion that they were experiencing experienced a healing inside of them. Somehow something improved in their emotional stability because they had the boldness to be honest and to say, I was angry in that moment. I was jealous in that moment. And that is so much on our soul work, our soul tending when the deepest part of us is angry or jealous or mad or you know whatever it is, is to name it and say, God, I'm angry. Why am I angry? God, I'm jealous. God, why did I just get mad? You know, and to name it. And there's something, they proved it in this study, but we know in Scripture that when we turn from that and we go to God, God comes in and fills that void and he heals, just like he did with my friend Susan on that night. And I told Susan, I said, Susan, you're probably going to cry a lot more. I mean, that's normal. But you just need to get into the pattern of dealing with the emotions that are inside of you, dealing with the grief that is inside of you. The simple act of labeling the emotion reduced its emotional impact on our own, on the moods of the people in that study. It also reduces the activation of the brain region associated with strong primitive emotions. So they studied it a whole lot more than I did, but not only did it change the emotion, it changed the way that our brain reacts. It changes it to where we don't hurt somebody else because we're angry. It, we don't have to do something rash. It changed the way that our brain is triggered and the brain, way that it reacts. Just in this one simple experiment of labeling the emotion you're feeling. Now think how much more powerful it is when we label that, when we name what's going on inside of us to the one that created us. You know, the Holy Spirit, the one that can heal us. And, and it's the way God designed us. We will always take the most care of what we value the most deeply. You know, we need to value our soul the most deeply. Um, and we need to be honest with ourselves when we're experiencing those emotions. We need to be honest with ourselves. And we need to take the most care of that. We live in a world that teaches us to be more concerned with the conditions of our cars, or our careers, or our portfolios than the conditions of our souls. You know, and just like I mentioned earlier, when, when, when it changes in your brain, you know, we impact those around us. Our impacts, our impacts, our actions impact those around us. You know, that's another reason we need to take care of our souls. You know, I think that's what Dallas Willard was saying to Eldridge in that thing. He says, when you're not in a good place, whether you mean to or not, you're going to impact those around you. So focus. You know, you hear this all the time. Well, i got to get myself in a good place before I can worry about helping so-and-so. There's so much truth in that. But most of the time when we're taking care of ourselves, we're just not spending any time with that person anymore. We're, we're breaking it off. Or we're, we're spending time apart, but we're really not doing any work to actually change ourselves. You know, we're not doing good, so I'm going to take care of myself. What does taking care of myself look like? Well, I'm not going to hang out with her anymore. That's not going to work. You know, you need to work on yourself. If you're going to work on yourself, work on yourself. I think you still work on yourself in the context of the relationship, but that's another, sometimes, maybe not, but sometimes I think you definitely can. Oh, goodness. 
this turned into a long sermon, didn't it, Rosemary? It's good though, thanks. Um, the sermon is the foundation. It's, it's 1140, and I'm going to have to... The soul needs a foundation, okay? We all know this. Jesus says uh, that you're a fool if you build your life, you build your house on something other than the firm foundation of his teaching. You know, and, his, and, and so you need a foundation. You need a firm foundation. Um, in, in Florida, it, it, they have these things called sinkholes. Have you all ever seen a picture of a sinkhole where all of a sudden there's something there and all of a sudden it's gone? And um, I'm glad we don't have many of those in West Texas. I've never seen one, but I guess we might. But what happens is the limestone that is underneath the ground, the, the acidic rainwater, you know, the rainwater that comes in with pollution and stuff, and then it goes down to the ground. And after years and years and years of doing that, that the acid and stuff that's in the rain eats through the limestone, and then all of a sudden, it's just gone. You know, and that's the same thing that can happen in our life. If we don't have a good foundation and we're allowing things that shouldn't be going down in that foundation, that after a while, it's just going to, and your life's just going to, you know, fall apart. Jesus talks very, very, very bluntly about the soul. Man, don't be worried about somebody that can kill your life. Be worried about somebody that can take your soul. And what he's saying is that, and if you ignore me long enough, you ignore me long enough, you're going to have enough acidic, acidic rainwater come through and eat that foundation out, and poof, your soul's going to, it's just going to, you're going to fall apart. You're going to fall apart, not only the here and now, the person that you're created to be. Um, it is 1140. So I want to talk about this next week, this next part next week. Because um, I... Yeah, I got a lot to go. This sermon turned out to be a lot longer than I thought. Less, less. Normally, I'm a lot better than this, and I'm normally better at. I'm normally finished by 11:30, right? So, uh, if I am going to invite, but well, well, thanks. Um, I'm gonna invite Bob to come up, but but Lord, we just uh, come to you today, and as we talk about the importance of our soul, and we talk about uh, just caring for our soul, you know, just Lord. Help us realize that, that, that we are needy. And that need comes from a desire that you placed inside of us for your grace. Um, Lord, and help us realize that. And that it's not something that we need to be trying to fill with other things, with idols, with other things. We need to fill it with your grace. And Lord, that you're the one um, that can, can give us that firm foundation. But we are the ones that are the tenders of that soul. And we're the ones that decide to work with you. You know, we can hold you at arm's length forever, but you want us to turn to you. Lord, help us turn to you. Help us acknowledge, you know, what's going on. Help us put words to what's going on so that we can talk about it to you so that you can come in and replace what is there with your grace. Lord, we love you and we praise you, worship you, and honor you. It's in Christ and in due pray. Amen. You're going to do the um, back to the song. Hey, to be honest, I've, I've gotten about nine hours of sleep the past two nights. So. I forgot communion. So we're going to participate in communion. I think we passed it out. And those of you that are gathered at home, y'all can go ahead and grab your communion cups. But um, this is, I love the fact that, you know, remember, 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 remember. And, and that's also a way of just reminding ourselves of who God is and the place that he has in us as the center, the foundation in our lives. Amen. Because when we, set up our lives to continuously remind ourselves of who God is. You know, this is one of those ways that we continually remind ourselves of the goodness of who God is in our life. You know, in the upper room, Jesus was gathered with his disciples, and he, uh, as the bread was going along, he took the, the bread and he broke it, and he said, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat of this, do so in the name. And a little bit later in that meal, the, the cup of wine came by and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant, not the old covenant, the new covenant. Whoever 
believes in me, drink this for the forgiveness of sins, not just for the here and now, but for whoever does this. So as we do this, we do this in remembrance of what Christ has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. And we remember that we realign ourselves with him. Father God, we ask that you just pour your Holy Spirit out on these simple elements of bread and juice. May they be for us the very presence of Jesus in our life. And may they, they come in and fill us and give us energy and nurture us and heal us. Lord, may your presence make us more and more into your hand. It's in Christ's name. Amen. So I'm going to go ahead and take the, the bread and then take the juice. Just a little while I'm going to need a prayer. Can't get you off of my soul. Came to say thank you, Lord. Just believe in me. Many times I do forget every need that you have made. Thank you, Lord. No, you're showing me. You are there when I'm down and out. You're holding me. Your love is so amazing. And yeah, you saved me. So here I am. With all I am. I raise my hands to worship you. I want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for everything that you are. You've got a million times my heart. I want to say thank you, Lord. I could have died in my sin, but you saved me. Didn't have any hope at all. You gave me peace to ride. Strength you carry on. Should have been the one with pain, but instead you took a place of moons and days. It's more than just a song. Even though I don't deserve the love for me, you took me on my throne. And you gave me love for me. So here I am, with all I am. I raise my hands to worship you. I want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for everything that we are. You come me and touch my heart. I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you for the sun. Thank you for the rain. To me and you, with all I am, I raise my hands to worship you. I want to say thank you. Thank you for everything that we have. You come to me and touch my heart. I want to say thank you. Thank you. I want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you. I want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you. Amen, amen. Thank you, Lord. Father God, as we leave this place today, man, we just uh, we open our eyes so that we may see the world as you see it. We see you as you truly are. And we see the world, others as you see them. And we may we see ourselves as you see. 
you'll be able to, to see the areas that you want to come in and fill, change, to make and to mold and refine and refine. Lord, may we have boldness and courage going along with you. In Jesus Christ, wonderful and holy name, we can and do pray. Amen. Go in peace. 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 Pe